Ramdas used to say, if you think you're enlightened, go home and spend the weekend with the family. Such wisdom in that saying. Because there's nothing like the family. They know where all the soft spots are, the vulnerabilities, where the buttons are. And one of the indicators of, of real awakening is how we respond to feedback, particularly critical feedback. Because it's re relatively easy to act enlightened, to be detached, to be cut off, to be above it all, to be unaffected. Yet it's not real. It's neither authentic or sustainable. But real awakening shows up in response to whatever arises. You may be familiar with the story about a, an old monk, a beautiful saintly being who lived in a hut by the river on the edge of a village. And every time the villagers came across him, they would remark on how saintly he was, how humble he was, how wonderful he was. And he'd just say, oh, is that so? <laughs> and it happened that a, um, a young woman in the village got pregnant. And when she could no longer hide it, her belly became so big, her parents demanded who was the father. And rather than admit to what was really going on and who her boyfriend was, she said, oh, it's the monk, the holy man. Everyone was outraged. The word spread through the village like wildfire. And a huge delegation marched out. And they ripped into this old man, telling him what they thought of him. And he listened to them. He said, oh, is that so? After a few more months, the baby was born. And the parents insisted on taking the, the newborn child out and giving this little baby girl to the monk. So here, take this, the fruit of your disgusting behaviour. He said, oh, is that so? And he took the child and cared for it. Now, the young girl was in grief and so upset by all this and being the loss of her newborn child. And after a few, just a matter of days, she couldn't stand it anymore. She told the truth and told her parents what really happened. Realising their mistake, they all went to the, to the old man and apologised profusely for actually slandering his name and saying he truly was a holy being. And he just said, ah, is that so? Now, that's an extraordinary space to be in. And for, for most of us, we understand the idea of that, yet behaviour is something else. It's really an information issue. There's always a gap between what we think and what we know and how we actually show up. So here's a really useful hint. Learn to fail gracefully. Yep, you stuff up. Particularly around critical feedback. Ah, that's okay. Let it go. One of our teachers, extraordinary woman, a Liz Green, Jungian analyst and astrological teacher, and she used to say, anything you deny, it doesn't go away. It goes down into the basement and makes bombs. Oh, such wisdom there. Yes, you can fake it, you can pretend, yet it's not sustainable, and the bombs will appear. Decades ago, a wise teacher said to me, Peter, if anyone really hurts you, particularly someone you love, someone who cares about you, if they rip into you, instead of defending, instead of reacting, open up. Open right up and allow it to sear into you. Let it touch the core of your being. Because extraordinary insights can arise when we actually stop being defended and open up. Because feedback is one of the keys for real growth. There's feedback you like, feedback you don't like, but there's no such thing as bad feedback. I remember riding my bike, I used to love motorcycling, and anyone who's ever ridden a bike 
knows that moment of flow when the bike, the rider, the sound, the wind, the road, everything just becomes one. And one day I was on a sweeping right hand corner going into a freeway just really laying in it, enjoying the flow of it. And suddenly a car just cut me off. Instantly, that ah, anger just arose. Then, ah, hang on. He may not have seen you. Who knows what was going on in their heads? They didn't do it deliberately. So, ah, okay, it's okay. Learning to fail gracefully. Catch yourself. Forgive yourself, let it be. There's a beautiful Zen story about a man who um, went out in a rowboat one day. It's a beautiful sunny day. So he got in the boat and rowed into the centre of the lake. And he got in the middle of the lake and he put the oars down and sitting in the boat, just listening to the lap, lap, lap of the water. And after a few moments, he lay down in the boat and just went off into a beautiful, spontaneous meditation. Absolute bliss. The gentle rocking of the boat. The sound of the waves and the wind. Then suddenly, bang! Another boat crashed into him. It woke him, shocked him out of his space. Furious, he got up ready to rip into this insensitive boatman. The other boat was empty. It had just been drifting. There was no other. And there is no other. A key issue here is the fantasy of separation. It's a myth. And the truth of this is actually presently before us. Like right now, just look around you, all these different objects. Try to separate anything. Try to separate this microphone stand from totality. Impossible. Yes, I can pick it up and take it out there, but it's still here. You cannot separate any object from totality. Everything is multisensory. Like right now, you can hear the wind chimes. Attempt to separate the visual from the audio. You can't. Yes, you can contrive it and close your ears and close your eyes to get. It's inseparable. The truth of this inseparable totality is right before us always. Or we separate with time. Past, present, future. I remember years ago working in Atlanta and being on the telephone talking to Kalyana here in Melbourne. According to time, I'm in yesterday and she's in tomorrow. Yet we're having a present conversation. And according to which reference point you take, one or other of us is in either in tomorrow or yesterday. It has no reality. Time, it's relatively useful. We all show up here at three o'clock on the first Sunday of the month. I mean, yeah, of course. These, these relative agreements are absolutely fine. No problem with that. Yet, it has no real reality. The world doesn't know whether this is Sunday or Monday or Wednesday. It's just this. Or we separate with judgments. I like this, I don't like this, I prefer this, I hate that. I want to hang on to this, I reject that. These emotional separations of push-pull, loving and hating, grasping and rejecting, it has no actual loving. What is is simply what is, with a conceptual overlay. Or, or this, that separation of inside and outside. In here, this internal realm of thoughts and feelings and imaginings and memories and insights and upsets. Out there, objects and sounds and sights and smells and vistas. 
Yet this separation again is only it only appears that way. Something happens in this field of awareness. It spontaneously springs up a memory and we project that memory and we clothe this world with that past experience. Or our imagination kicks up. That stump looks like a wicked witch and all sorts of fears and anxieties spontaneously arise. This outside-inside separation, it seems so obvious, but it doesn't show up, stand up to investigation. Or that fundamental separation of me and the world. It's simply not true. That this wakefulness, this presence, the thought stream, the objects appearing, the witnessing, they're not different things, they are one. And when you grasp that, everything changes. Sailor Bob used to nail it so exquisitely with two words, intelligence, energy. Putting those two words together, everything is self-shining intelligence, energy, inseparable. There's a discipline called complexity science, or it's also called complex adaptive systems. This is the convergence of quantum physics, chaos theory, evolutionary biology, and systems thinking. And those four disciplines coming together open up this new extraordinary insight which simply says the same things the ancients have always said. There's just this. And there's a key concept in, in, in complexity science, this word, emergence, which points to this spontaneous, self-organising, self-creating, ever-learning, ever-evolving, ever-changing system. And it doesn't matter whether you look at the way the, the planetary system works, whether you look at the social system of a group of people together, whether you look at a human brain with the neurons firing, or whether you look at abstraction and the mind, or whether you look at an ecology, flora and fauna interacting, or a weather system, it all operates the same way. These elements interact. Regularities happen. Feedback happens. The feedback changes the behaviour. Patterns arise. The patterns change the behaviour. And this ever-learning, ever-evolving system simply unfolds, inseparable. Forty years ago, David Bohm called it unbroken wholeness. It's just this. When you grasp that, the world changes profoundly. Because there are no mistakes. There are no accidents here. Whatever is appearing in the field is a beautiful, exquisite reflection of everything that is needed. So, anyone appearing in this field of awareness is critical. How beautiful. Open up. What is the living here? Anyone you react to, how exquisite. What unowned aspect of self is being projected and then reacted to when we, when we see it? The simplicity of this is extraordinary. Everything we need is always simply here. Just open up. Open up to the field. And notice the labelling, the judging, the habits, and then simply rest back as the field. And a particular window is to look in a place <coughs> we don't like to look. A beautiful mythic story of the princess and the frog. When she embraces that ugly frog, he turns into the handsome prince. Transformation spontaneously happens. There's a, um, a book called Master Keys to Self Realization. This was um, Siddha Rameshwa, who was Nisargadatta's guru. Nisargadatta only spent a short time with his guru before he died. 
after he died, he and a number of other disciples compiled these lectures together. And there's this beautiful line. It says something like, after the self is realized intellectually, to fully realize this, make everyone happy. Because everyone is the self. Or in uh, John's uh, letters to the disciples in the New Testament, he says, God is love. And everyone who loves lives in God, and God lives in them. So everything we need is always presently here. And feedback is the key. Every time that you judge, how exquisite. Because objects create subjects. So where is the judging being here? Where is the reference point? Have a look. Every time you react to someone, how exquisite. What is unknown to you? Because so often the key for transformation is in the place we reject. You know, deep work, working one-on-one -on -one with people, at some point rather you, you, you start to deal with the dark side, with the unwanted aspects of self. And it's gently working, being present to and simply being available to what is rejected and looking for what is the gold here? What is this unwanted aspect of self? And inevitably, some beautiful, un exquisite, unexpected insight appears. Do you have suggestions on how to be more aware of it being one whole system? There's some practical things that can be done in the meantime. Just as soon as you notice, labeling, stop labeling. Okay? Walking around, just walking without labeling. Because the, habit, the, the memory machine just runs automatically. You know, this is this, this is this, this is this. And as soon as you notice it, ah, oh, there you go. Just fail gracefully. Oh, doing it again, that's okay. It's the gentleness is, is the key. Because you see it. Then if you beat yourself up about it, you actually re recreate the story. If you attempt to ignore it, you recreate the story. Just like, ah, oh, there you go. Labeling you again. It's okay. And another hint is the habit of noticing things, seeming objects in that scene. If you fall back and stay in the noticing, that's not the content of what's arising, it's simply the noticing, the seeing as such. So the seeing isn't about the particular object that's been fixated on. There's another step that's happened there. There's seeing, then object, fixation, etc. But falling back into that seeing or the noticing and taking it, the attention away from the content. Because the thing is, it's, all, it's already happening. You know, the, the pure seeing, the, the hearing, the feeling, the tasting, the touching, the sensing, is always already happening in an unfixated open way. And it's the habit of noticing the thought stream. So it's not we have to do something else. We just stop doing the other thing. And again, just, just oh, there you go. As soon as it's noticed, what's noticing it? It's that wakefulness that's noticing it. And it's giving a hint. Just follow those hints. Yeah. So could you say that's recognising, yeah. recognising, as exactly. Bob says, yeah. Yeah. what's going on? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the recognise is, it puts it beautifully. Mm. Because it's already, as he mm. says, already been cognised. Yeah. Mm. And it's been recognised. It mm. points beautifully to it. Mm. Mm. I was interested in you talking about the rejection mm. because from my experience, 
that's when you learn the most. It's exactly. looking at those rejections. Yeah. Yeah. It's adversity that teaches you. Mm. Mm. That's yeah. where you learn about yourself and what's Absolutely. going on. Yeah. 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 In the medieval traditions mm. of alchemy, European alchemy, they would start with a base metal, you know, lead, or sometimes they would use you know, stuff like animal manure. And that would be the, the basic material they'd start to work with. And the object was through a series of long processes and experiments that this base metal or this base substance would be transmuted into gold. Now, the actual work that was really going on was a profound psychological mm. transition, transformation. Mm. That was what was really taking the material in the flask and the various other uh, components in alchemy was purely that in which to project the contents of the psyche as such a device. And so that's uh, that transformation you know, is, is about the, the cleaning up as such or the incorporating. But it's very interesting because the that base metal or the parts that are rejected, you know, the lead or the the animal manure and various other substances that we use, that base substance, is actually what turns into gold. Mm -hmm. So quite often, the stuff that's rejected, you know, you know, people identify certain things within them they don't like, and they reject it. And as Peter said before, that quote, it just goes down to the basement and makes bombs. Mm -hmm. It becomes problematic. And then there's a lot of wrestling going on to try and stop the thought and stop the fixation, rather than just combing it out like you comb hair mm -hmm. so it is a non-issue because mm -hmm. some of this stuff is housework mm -hmm. you know? and some of it is just changing habits dramatically like full stop or mm -hmm. various other things but some of it is actually requires a bit of housework because it's habitual stuff and it can be very useful and very helpful mm -hmm. without getting caught up in a great long process and spending years and years and years doing something that's essentially can be done far more economically can be very useful to clean up a bit of this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting. I've had a few dramas recently, and I was thinking the other day, gee, it's, I've been out of control lately. And I thought, <laughs> hang on, that's a profound thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's literally right. <laughs> I am out of control. I'm not controlling any of it. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Try controlling the weather. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And it's this inside outside stuff. Yeah. It's, we, in the mid-70s, we spent three months in a Sufi community in Indonesia. And the master there was always on about work. Everyone, he wanted everybody to work. Because it's like, it's a healthy corrective to this internalising. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And we often encourage people just to focus externally. Because mm -hmm. it makes no difference. In and out, it's all the same. You know? mm -hmm. Yet this can be really mm -hmm. illuminating to actually walk in a different place. Because this can get so neurotic, isn't it? You know, self-obsessive loops. Mm. It's attributed mm. to Heraclitus, who was the teacher of Plato, two and a half thousand years ago. Mm. You cannot step into the same river twice. Because mm. yeah. mm. everything is new. Everything is self-organising. It's everything's always changing. And starting to let that become alive to you, the whole world changes. There's no other. Mm. There's no accidents. So everyone in your field is there because they're you. There's no objective world out there just as there's no objective self in here. There's simply this unicity. We think you've bits of our existence when there's something be better. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. There's something that's bugging you like a person. Mm. You think of that person went mm. away, mm. Yeah. but you can't, right? Yeah. So the problem is not the person, the problem is you're thinking about yeah. that person. And just see that and, and change it. Mm. Stop it. The, the coins always have two sides and a middle. <laughs> they set. <laughs> can't do anything about it, they just yeah. as they are. Yeah. <laughs> and this, um, in the Zen tradition, there's a beautiful metaphor that um, they're talking about this mirror mind, this extraordinary intelligence, and that it... Um, it has this capacity to record 
everything that ever happens to you in your life is spontaneously recorded. And there is spontaneously replayed according to associations, whether it's internally or externally. And the exquisite subtlety is that what is replayed are traces. It's not the memories themselves, or it's traces. And they just simply appear and disappear. Left alone, they just bubble off. It's when we fixate, when we start to actually buying into them, that they turn back into thoughts, back into memories, back and become present experience again. And such such an exquisite hint here that just let it let it just let it be. Something arises, left alone, it moves and disappears. Appearing, disappearing, reappearing. And you fix that on, it seems to get worse, like it gets more, yeah. more heavier. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it concretizes things. Yeah. <laughs> you have to try and do it. You let it go the first time. Yeah. But see, yeah. knowing that, Michael, knowing that, mm. why continue? Mm. And again, this is this, this hint of failing gracefully. Because yeah. it's really an information issue here. We've all got more than enough information to get on with it. And, you know, there's... This, those old habits and just see them see through it and it starts to fall away it starts to loosen the knots loosen yeah. unraveling happens and uh, you know memory is remarkably unreliable <laughs> because is it for something to be remembered well, there's usually some kind of strong emotional charge to it. And so every time there's a trigger and that thought arises, there'll be another response to that in the feelings or the emotions. So this is kind of cacophony of, of stuff. The trace is, is not a pure trace, if, if you want to put it in those terms. It's not like a video camera taking a picture. So every time something arises, a memory, a trace from the past, it's changed in the present. So it's not a consistent thing. If you've known people for a very long time and they've recounted something years ago and they're recounting the story years later, there's, you know, it's quite a, it's, it's sometimes the stories are unrecognised. And, and again, there's nothing wrong here. Mm. Yeah. It's just it, the way it works. This is the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. But there you go. That's okay. Because, yeah. like, it's... Commonly, people think, "Ah, oh, look, when this me arrived at two or three, then you know that's it all went downhill." No. You know, it's not an accident that a reference point arises. It's mm. part of being a human being. You know. mm. It's not a problem to be got got rid of. It's simply to be seen for what yeah. it is. You know. you know, reference points will always arise. Mm. It's about not owning them or buying yes. into yeah. them. Yeah. 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 you know, the mirage is a mirage. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a big deal. Mm. Beliefs. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But so that comes back to that the, the issue, the only issue is fixation mm. and the, the, the thing that gets fixated on the most is this notion of the separation the me mm. notion, the mm. I the identity that we imagine we are, mm. which again is a compilation of thoughts mm. you know, and quite unreliable mm. Mm. If, you know, people describe themselves and other people describe them, so it's like you've got a whole <coughs> room of people rather than one person. Mm -hmm. So it's all conceptual. Everything is conceptual. It's mm -hmm. all a construction. And that's not a problem. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. When we imagine that as the real, mm -hmm. take that as the real, then there's suffering. Mm -hmm. That's when the drama starts. Yeah, we live in it as real. Well, yeah. You're living in the dream, yeah. if you like. Yeah. Yeah. You put belief into it. You, you take it as the real. So in seeing that everything is conceptual, every seeming thing is conceptual, and that key thing, so-called thing in that, is this me notion, which is just another object in the scene. Mm. Seeing that, then it takes the sting out. Mm. And the seeming separation starts to get very fuzzy starts to get very very fuzzy and very blurry and then that clarity of seeing no division no separation the unity 
the completeness, the wholeness, the singularity of the what is becomes apparent. That was so key that this person told me 30, 40 years ago, just particularly people who love you, because mm. the truth is often spoken so clearly yeah. by those who love you, and particularly when they're angry. Mm. And just, just to, just to go counterintuitively to all the defensive routines when you can, and just allow it in, allow it mm. to touch deeply. And that sense starts a spontaneous self-organising mm. unfolding. You know, this, the insight you have is really valuable because you know there are these, these sore spots, mm. these tender spots, these, this woundedness. And it's usually, you know, just like a, an animal's foot will sort of be so protective around something. You know? mm. They're often, this often really useful things there. And you can just simply, I mean, you can either be, go completely, be completely present to it, so there's no you that's just the experiencing, and something extraordinary happens when that happens, or else the other end of the stick, just really look for the me, the holder of this, this wound. Now, where is the me that is holding this wound that is so defended? And of course, we know intellectually that it can't be found. Mm. Yet the, the, the hint is just to actually do the investigation so thoroughly that it's seen through. Because with, without a me, me story, there's no story. Yes. Yeah. But uh, it's not that we get answers, it's simply that the questioner falls away. And so a practical hint, those unwanted, those wounded places, those, they, they can be incredibly useful, incredibly rich places to explore. And when we fail and stuff up, just fail gracefully. Oh, there you go, that's okay. And every time that happens, a loosening happens. Because it's the whole, this whole universe runs on feedback. It's the key ingredient that that creates a spontaneous learning, the spontaneous changing, evolving. It's the mental shift that it's a, that these things are useful. <laughs> it is a dramatic shift. Yeah. Because yeah. of the moment of their problems, but it's very yeah. really useful because they can... Um, yeah. Yeah. But the exploring too doesn't mean you get on there and you get on the whatever it is and you start riding it and keeping on going. Okay. Because they just actually accelerates and creates more yes. stuff. Mm. So it's a subtle thing here about seeing and recognising mm. you know, and that feedback uh, but not turning it into something else, you know, going on a trip, a big journey with it and starting the story each day. Yes. Mm. It's just yeah. more of the same. Yes. It's a very, so it's a very subtle thing that's been pointed to. Mm. <coughs> and again, as Peter said, coming back to that notion of the me, I mean, where's it being held? And where's it being judged from? What? How is the discerning taking place between something that is seemingly uh, desired or pleasure or something that's wanted and something that's unpleasant and is rejected? Yeah. So at the core there, there's some kind of discernment. You know, there's been some labelling yeah. and a decision that one is preferable and one is definitely mm. not preferable. Mm. And that both of them require energy. Mm. Both of them require oxygen. So if there's something that's unpleasant, first of all, there's been a labelling mm. at that reference point. And then there's some effort going into pushing this thing away. And while, while ever we're in battle with something, we're giving them oxygen giving it oxygen, mm. keeps it alive, it's a dance, it's two. And some labels are easy to see through when some are really st st yeah. stuck, up really tired. Yeah, the blind spot ones, they're yeah, the best, yeah, yeah. they're yes. the best. Mm. So. Sorry about that. Mm. Yeah. And the exquisite thing is, you're speaking so clear. Yes. Yeah. So the intelligence that you are is knowing this. And that's, that's so fascinating. Yeah. As people outline their dilemma, 
and they're very clear about how it works and how it doesn't work and how the pattern goes and all that. And so the question is, where is this being articulated from? It's wakefulness, it's self-speaking. Yeah. So the knowing that you are is already clear about this. Yeah, I enjoyed a lot when in one moment you know there was no assessment of the moment before and then in the next one after that there's no assessment of the one before, <laughs> just before that. I usually don't get past a couple, but it's good. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm not a snap to do a thing, it's an instant Yeah, that stay in that noticing, yeah. you know, rather than the, the content of the yeah. noticing. And it happens or it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that's the habit, is yeah. we focus in on the content uh, as we were just speaking before, we label it mm. as something we either like or we don't like, and then we go into battle as if mm. it's somehow it's real. Mm. And so, falling back into that noticing, mm. not the content that's appearing, but falling back into that spaciousness or awareness, you know, relaxing back in that awareness that you are. And then content rises, content subsides, but if there's no fixation, if there's no interaction, if there's no wanting to kind of throttle the daylights out of it or hang on to it, keep it, just, you know, moves and flows as it does like in the sky. Yeah. I've recently, very recently, discovered that everything is to be trusted, <laughs> <laughs> which was a massive realisation. Mm. It gave almost like an acceptance of whatever is going on here is perfect. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. have to do anything. Yeah. And the thought that I need to do more, the mm. thought that I, I'm not good enough, or the mm. thought that I need to get there, wherever mm. there is, mm. really had me chasing this thing yeah. that I would never reach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it just stopped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because this intelligence is total. It's not like necessarily just located here. Mm. It's everything mm. and everywhere. Intelligence mm. and energy. It's allowed also the grasping to subside. Yeah. Yeah. And from that place there was a deep wound that arose mm. Mm. and a cry from within that yeah. I hadn't accessed yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. It was lodged. Mm. 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 Yeah. Mm. And, and it's no accident we talk about the defendant self mm. and self-defense because everyone has a wounding. Mm -hmm. And how exquisite is part of the human condition. And it's the thing that actually often encourages us to look and to be dissatisfied and to explore. This workshop I was at earlier this week, where the cry happened, um, from that place, these words just came out of my mouth. It wasn't even thinking. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, they're laughing at me. It was just mm -hmm. these words came out. Yeah, yeah. So, Oh, where did that come from? Mm, mm. And it was like a, a really early memory yeah, that I yeah, hung on to yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and created a whole life around. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, and again, we're, we're always doing the best we can. Mm -hmm. Great decision as a young child. Not necessarily the most useful life de decision, yet existentially absolutely appropriate. Mm -hmm as a vulnerable young being. <clears throat> because when the cry happened, there was a group, there was an actual group who had mm. finished the mm. breath work and they mm. were mm. having a cup of tea and I could hear them in the background just sort of giggling and, mm. you know, talking. Yeah. But then that came from yeah. that and, yeah. It, yeah. and then the memory came back mm. Mm. of um, of where I decided back then yeah, yeah. Yeah. to um, almost... Uh, whenever I would then go back to a group to deny this mm, mm, mm. and when the words came up the other day of oh they're laughing at me there was a decision to to not have to deny this yeah. to enter yeah. any yeah. Yeah. group yeah. 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 thank you for sharing that intimate mm. stuff because 
Mm. That's the sort of the material of mm. allowing the woundedness to, to touch, mm. be touched. You know. Because I suppose when I first came to Bob's talks, and it was almost like again a, a part of me that wanted to deny the human experience. Yes. Yeah. And yet it's mm. it's almost embracing. It's the, yeah. it, not almost. It's the exact opposite. Absolutely. Mm. And this is the funny thing. It's like. There's so many misunderstandings about mm. this work. You know, people think, ah, oh, you get free, you get detached. No, mm. you get more connected. Mm. You, can, you know, empathy increases, openness increases, vulnerability increases. Because if, when you start to get that you are everyone, mm. how could there be a separation? Mm. Well, take this seriously, that mm. there is no separation. Mm. That everything is self-organizing. That everything is intelligent. Mm. It's not random or accidental. Mm. Your world is exclusively self-creating. Mm. There's a perfect reflection. Everything you need is readily available. Mm. And it's, it's the inside offering to us is beautiful. Trust. Mm. Trust everything. Mm. Open up into it. Mm. Be available to it. Be vulnerable to it. If there's no separate self or protection mechanism, how can the universe be out to get it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because that, that image of like when we, you know, something happens and we try to suppress it, mm. and it's like, it's like a character running away and another character chasing it, and you're both of them. <laughs> <laughs> or the beautiful traditional image of like you, you have a, a blood stain on a cloth, mm. and so you, you rinse it in blood to remove the, the stain. Mm. With the intelligence too, you can tend to think that intelligence is reasoned thought, mm, yeah. but it's not. It's inherent in everything. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's the drive behind yeah. the tiniest to the largest. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to leave a slice of bread on the kitchen bench for a couple of weeks, and it's just like without any effort mm. by anyone. It's got mould and the spores, and it's making billions of spores and it's just life, it's teeming with life, it's like that innate intelligence knows precisely what to do, it's automatic. So that's where the trust everything comes, because it's alive. Well, the bread can do it. There's no need for the bread bread school. <laughs> Doesn't need any dough. It's all free. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. We can create all sorts of explanations and stories, and they're very beautiful. But coming back to the immediacy, let, let all that go. Just this immediacy. It's so still, it's so profound, it's so intense, it's so immediate. That's what we are. No corruption, no distortion. Nothing's been lost, nothing's been contaminated, nothing's been polluted. That essence that we are is pure, is perfect. And it's only the stories and the, all the other sorts of things that um, we've all been talking about today that takes us up into abstraction mm. and away, seemingly away, from that noticing. And all of, the, the, all of this, of course, is the, in the content and is the content of the noticing. So it's a beautiful expression, a beautiful manifestation Everything is essentially that one essence, that one energy, playing and dancing like the trees mm. in this manifestation. And is no, no different from that essence. Sometimes it can be taken that the, there is the, you know, the awareness, the, the absolute, and then somehow through Maya, through confusion or illusion, something else gets in the way. But there's no distinction. There's no distinction. Everything that is expressing is the thatness. 
expressing those particularised forms of form. And a great line from the Hinsing Ming. Um, which is completely gone. <laughs> <laughs> to deny, no, it's, it's back again. You see, the mind is a really interesting thing, an absurdity. To deny the reality of things is to miss their reality, and to assert the emptiness of things is to miss that reality. It's really beautiful. It's very subtle. It, to deny the reality of things is to miss their reality. To assert the emptiness of things is to miss their reality. Mm. So, mm. everything is real, but not as it's being construed. Mm. That's the tagline. <laughs> so, all teaching is an abstraction. That's conceptual. Mm. Mm. Everything it said is conceptual. Yes. Yeah. Conceptual, conceptual, conceptual. Mm. Yes. Mm. And there's no problem. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's neither good or not good. It's just in that recognition, there's a frame. Just as the you know that well-worn uh, image, traditional image of the the mirage, yeah. looks like water on the road. And after it's been seen a few times. There's a very deep knowing that, in fact, it's not water at all, it's a mirage. But you can't say the mirage is real, or you can't say it's false. In actual fact, the mirage is real, it's a real mirage. It's not a pretend one. <laughs> you know? So this gets really tricky, because otherwise, see, the mind loves to divide. It likes something to be real and something to be not real. And that's duality. Once we're very clear on one thing, we've created its opposite. Mm. So in a, in a sense, nothing can be seen. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Zip it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what Papaji used to say? Be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, you never zip the wrong places. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, exa that's exactly it. And that, I think that was the moment I had earlier the week, was when all the chatter stopped, and I, it was almost like a conscious decision. Can I trust not to have the chatter? Can I let go? And will I be alive at the end of that? And in fact, there was just life after that. It was just, oh, this is just happening. Mm. This is this is alive. Mm. Mm. Uh, letting go and trusting are, the, are so uh, mm. together, aren't they? Mm. 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 And the key is what's letting go mm. and what's trusting. Mm. Mm. What's not letting go and what's not trusting. Mm. So going to the, the core, the very core of it. Mm. The idea of ourselves. Yeah. Mm. That that is doing. Mm. Yeah, the doer, which is a beautiful, beautiful word. Mm. It expresses it very well, I think. So the notion of being the doer, the one that's driving things, the one that's in control, the one that's in charge. Such a uh, magnificent fantasy. Mm. So when Taz said, you know, trusting earlier, Rob, I felt letting go, like a mm. meeting mm. peace came. Mm. So I didn't generate it, you mm. said it, mm. I was exposed to it and then mm. I could feel letting go and then mm. just peace mm. because if based on the concept of if you trusted everything then mm. but it wasn't like mentally I did anything, it just happened just then when you said it's trust. And Good. everything is that, the thatness, mm -hmm. you know, the Mahavakya, when they say everything is that. And there's not another word that comes after that. You know, I mean, that is not a complete sentence. <laughs> there's something missing, isn't there? Because it can't be expressed. Yes. It can't be quantified. It can't yeah. be named. And in that statement, one of the great statements, 
Mahabakya. You are that, or everything is that, or that thou art. They don't mean with a bit of work, you know, you can get to that. Or a bit of polishing up or a bit of improvement, you can get to that. It's a statement of fact is now. It's a, and that's the very thing that Nisargadatta took on board as fact from his teacher. His teacher said, you are that. And he went, yep, total acceptance. And then it was just a question of reaffirming and seeing that for himself. Mm. So every spare moment, this is in his words, he would come back to that immediacy, that presence, awareness, that the I amness that he calls, he calls it, which is cutting back all the thoughts, leaving the thoughts aside and cutting back to that core wakefulness. When you wake in the morning, it's, it's just a wakefulness before we re-inhabit that character, before the, we put the overcoat of, on of identity. So cutting, that's what he did. He took on board as fact that he was that. And then every spare moment, just leave the thoughts aside, or if the thoughts keep running, doesn't matter. Just take the attention out, let them do their thing. They're not yours anyway. And come back to that immediacy.